you know, as athletes, you think you're invincible and, and you have this macho image. And my first concussion occurred in Madison Square Garden, and uh, it was 1990 in the playoffs. And there was about two minutes to go in the game. And I remember getting hit and um, going into the net. And Chris Nyland was following me. I think he's a Boston player, BU guy, wasn't he? And he was kind of leading me into James Patrick. And it was kind of an instant play, but yet the defenseman was coming at me, and I go was going to the net, and I had full speed, and he was coming full speed. And Chris Nyland was kind of steering me into it, and bang, I hit his shoulder. And his force of his shoulder that hit my head, I was out instantly. And, and looking at the tape now, the back of my head, fortunately, had my helmet on, I hit the ice also. And the only thing I can remember was that the trainer was trying to coming in and out of consciousness, I guess I was starting to swallow my tongue and I was going through a little bit of convulsions. And um, it must have seemed like an eternity, but I remember getting wheeled off and the hostile fans at the garden were yelling all kinds of things. And uh, that was my first real severe concussion, which was a grade, grade three. And I was sitting in the medical room with the doctors and I was in and out two or three times. And I remember saying at one point to the doctor, I'm fine. I'm ready to go. Everything's fine, Doc. Put me out there. He said, game's been over for five minutes. I said, oh. The next thing I remember, I, I came to again. I said, could you, could you call my wife? And fortunately, I remembered the number. And that night, I remember being strapped to a headboard and going to the hospital and having all kinds of CAT scans. And uh, fortunately, everything was OK. But I had the, the worst headache and felt like somebody had just taken all the energy out of me for about 10 days. And just as Dr. Kelly had described, blurred vision and kind of glossy-eyed and no enthusiasm. And, um, but I thought, well, this is a concussion. We're athletes. We'll overcome this. This is only going to last for a week. And fortunately, it lasted about 10 days. And we're right back at it, playing hockey again. And, and really, I kind of put that behind me and never thought that would come back around. And it wasn't until about two years later where I received another one. And just so happened that was in the same building. And I remember it wasn't as severe because I wasn't unconscious, but I remember skating around the rink and looking at my trainer, and everything was in slow motion. And I remember, i got to get off the ice. Something's not right. And at that point in time, back then, it was, it was talked upon that, oh, you just got your bell rung. Get back in there. You, you know, you're fine. How many fingers? And, you know, there was a course of action that was more on the, obviously, a lighter end of things. And um, so I remember going into the, the locker room, and the trainer came in, and he said, uh, so who's playing? Who's their goaltender, and what's the score? And I said, boy, their masks look a lot alike. And I said, it's uh, got to be Richter, and it's 3-2. to two. And I felt pretty confident that it, that's what it was. And, it ended up being Van Beesbrook, and it was 2-1. to one. We were losing. So, of course, I didn't play that game. But then I was feeling pretty good. I played two nights later. And my third concussion, and I'm kind of going through this rather quickly, my third concussion was against Quebec, where a guy by the name of Matt Sundin just happened to catch me blindsided with his elbow. And I remember sitting on the bench, and I told my trainer, she said, something's not right. And he just said, just stay here. And you know, we're not going to play you for this period, but we'll just sit on the bench, and after the period, we'll, we'll talk. And I remember looking, and all of a sudden, the period was over, and I was in the locker room, and I remember turning to one of my teammates, and um, this was further on in the period, and I said, what's the score? He said, it's, it's two to one. I said, two to one. I said, who scored? Who scored? I, That's great. We're winning. He said, you did. You scored, and you got an assist. And I said, oh, man. So I, I don't remember. And then I went and played that game. And fortunately, things started to come back to me. And I was able to play the rest of the game. But the trainer knew that I wasn't all there. And as these things went, around, went on, you just took it for granted. You got your bell rung. You know, you're going to bounce back. Everything's going to be fine. Well, as, as your injuries escalate, and as you know now, there is such thing as a cumulative effect. But back then, we just thought it was macho. You got, hey, you got hit, you got hit, you're going to bounce back. You're, you're an athlete. You're supposed to overcome these things. Well, it wasn't too long after where I had another concussion, and I actually took a stick across the jaw where my jaw was broken and um, had to have my jaw wired and felt like 
a firecracker went off in my mouth, and I never, never even considered that. I most likely received something then, too. I never counted all the, the dings where you got hit so hard in the boards and you kind of just disoriented, but then things snapped back right in place and you were back playing. And you never considered those concussions either. And then I took a real severe one in Buffalo. It was 1996. And it was a six foot six player, 235 pounds, and I was cut across the middle like I've done for 15 years. And the next thing I know, I was cutting back, and I, the last half of a second, I tried to lean back, and that was it. I, I couldn't get out of the way, but the force of his shoulder had hit the only part of the weakest part of my body, which is my neck and head. And at six six, the six six, the strongest part of his body is hitting the weakest part of my body. Something's going to give. And I remember rotate. well, I don't remember, but I'm watching on video, but I rotated and lost my helmet and was unconscious, and it's when my forehead slapped on the ice. And I was out for about 10 seconds, 8 to 10 seconds, because we reviewed it later. And the thing that's scary was I remember waking up in the locker room and looking at the clock. This happened about five minutes into the game, and I remember looking at the clock in the lounge, sitting in, a, in one of the couches, and I was looking, I said, uh, wow, periods don't, you know, what, was I, what am I doing in my equipment? You know, we're playing a game. I should be out there. Why am I sitting here? The trainer finally came in and explained because I didn't know what was happening to me. Meanwhile, I had consciously got up from the trainer after I was knocked out, skated to the bench, I guess, and I was on there. And it was almost like you're, you're there, but nothing was recording. And one of the trainer had... One of the trainers had come in, the skate sharpener who I was real close with, because he'd heard some voices. And he had come in, and he had said, uh, you OK? And I guess I told him I was fine. But at the time, he said no one was there, but I was speaking, I guess. And so it's not to me, you know, some guys might think it's funny because they tell these stories. But as time goes on, it, it really scares you, because at that point in time, I turned to the doctor, and he had said, you're not going back. That's it. You're not going to play. And I, I, I was scared to go back because for the first time it wasn't one of those things where you had the desire to get back in there. This one was, this felt different, but yet I, I didn't have any headaches and yet I, I just felt like something changed, but I'd listen to the doctor and come to think of it later on, it was a grade three concussion. I should have been sent to the, the hospital. I should have spent the night, but I remember as an athlete that, you know, you're going to overcome these things and so I'd ask... The doctor, yeah, I'm fine. I can drive home. I'm, I'm sure that I've had these before. You know, concussions, I'm out for a week, 10 days or something. I'm sure I'll bounce back. And I just had one about a year earlier. And I was out the same amount of time, about 10 days to, to two weeks. So the next course of action was I asked one of the players if he could follow me home. And when I think about that, how I ever did that and how the player, you know, we're at a level of professional sports where, you know, those things shouldn't be happening. I wasn't at a place rationally or consciously to even make a decision like that. And it said, stated that that fall was Mike Leuda. The Players Association gave every trainer, coach, and um, doctor strict rules that said, if you're unconscious, it's a grade three, and you should be sent for tests in the hospital. Well, I was literally a grade three because I was out. I was unconscious, but they deemed me a grade two, and so I didn't have to see the doctor until the next day. Fortunately, nothing tragic happened driving home, and I, but it was a little strange now. I don't remember much about it. And then I was out about a week, and I went to see one of the doctors and the physicians, and I said, I, I think I'm, I'm okay because I remember these symptoms, and they're not as bad. Something's different, but I don't have any real bad headaches. And He says, well, this is your fifth or sixth concussion now, I think we should be careful here. But uh, if, if you're still feeling good, there, you know, your symptoms aren't too bad, then you can skate you know, on Tuesday. I think it was about three or four days later. So I did that, and I still didn't feel too bad. Something wasn't right, but I wasn't going to admit that because I was captain of the team, and I wanted to make sure I was there and supporting my teammates and taking on that responsibility to uh, not show any of that weakness, of course, because it's a macho thing. And, you feel that responsibility. The next thing I remember, I played a week later against Montreal, and I remember being so tired. I never remember having to get myself so worked up, and I couldn't sleep that afternoon. 
Jeez, it just didn't feel right on the ice, and I'm sure I'm going to snap out of it. Everything's going to be fine. You know what? The doctor said it's okay, and just I'll, I'll be fine. So it was the two nights later we played another game. Same thing. I was having trouble sleeping, and I was. I guess I started saying some strange things and wasn't myself. And one of the sports writers came up to me and says, "Boy, you look real pale. Is everything okay?" And I said, "Oh yeah, everything's fine. I'll be fine." You know, I'm probably just a little tired. Lots been going on. And he says, all right. I said, fine. And so I went and played that night. And I remember flying into New York after the game. I said, I've never been so tired in my life. And all of a sudden, I started feeling like something was being taken away. Something, my enthusiasm, my drive, I wasn't sleeping, just didn't care about things. I said, something's not right. And we went on that Western road trip, and it just started spiraling downhill. And then I started to have bouts where I, I became very emotional. And things were just starting to slow down and get strange. And I remember telling my coach to the point where I said, you know, someday um, I look forward to just owning a bookstore, selling books. And he said, what do you mean by that? I understand. He said, well, this, this stuff's getting old and something's not right and I'm not sure about this. And We had a home game and he kind of parked that away and, and fortunately he's a coach that was not only concerned about the player but he's concerned about the person. Well, we ended up going to back to Buffalo and I played against Philadelphia that night and here I was, still had been sleeping and I've been trying to hold everything together because you're the captain and you want to say everything's okay and you smile and my face was getting more pale and things were getting strange and so I, I still tried to play that game and after that game everything slowed down the speed of the pot I couldn't take a pass I remember like as though things were going in front of me and I remember hoping that game was getting over quick because I shouldn't be out here and after the game was over I stood up and t talked to my teammates as a captain basically in tears and saying, I'm sorry, guys, I haven't been playing up to my capabilities. I've let you guys down, and I, I need to play better. I don't know what's wrong with me. So the guys thought that was, you know, admirable, but, you know, that's, something's not right. And I remember that night just totally emotionally just letting everything go. And from that point on, things got strange. I, I wasn't sleeping. Things were worse. And now I know that I was taxing a brain who's had multiple concussions that hasn't had a chance to heal. I remember seeing the doctor the next morning, scared, terrified, emotional, and he said to me, this is normal. He said, you're the captain of the team. He said, you just come, come off a World Cup championship with Team USA. He said, you're father of three. Your team's lost a few games. You haven't scored a couple goals. They put that in a soup bowl, mix it together. It's no wonder you feel the way you feel. And I looked at him, and I, I was scared to death. And I had tears, and I said, I'm telling you, Doc, something's not right. I said, I've never been like this before. He said, listen. He says, go out. I'm sure you get a couple goals. Your team wins. Everything's going to be fine. And I looked at him with tears, and I said, I don't care about scoring goals. I had no desire. I got in that car, and it was as though nobody understood. My wife was wondering what was going on. My teammates were wondering. The doctor didn't even understand. And those probably were the longest two weeks because it got to the point where I got so withdrawn. Well, th the next day I happened to go see Teddy Nolan, who saw me and said, you know that comment you made in Colorado about owning a bookstore? And I was still holding it together a little bit. He said, what's going on? Something's not right. Are you okay? And then again, I, I broke down. And he looked at me and he said, we've got to get you some help. He said, we were leaving for Hartford that day. We were going to go there. This was just before Hartford moved down to Carolina. And he says, you're not going. He says, I don't care what I have to tell the press. I don't care what. You can't play hockey in this state. You're the captain of the team here never seen you. You're the one that's used to carrying things on your shoulder. You can't even carry a conversation. Something's not right. So I went home still 
We don't to know what's happening to me, what's going on. I'm emotional, I'm depressed, I'm not myself, I can't sleep. I, now, the anxiety, I can't sleep, I'm starting to get anxiety attacks. I'm starting to get these headaches that are starting to come. But they didn't come initially. And that was a concern because whenever I had a concussion, I had a headache right off the bat. Now I started getting these headaches and they got worse to the point where there are migraine headaches where I'd be up three, four hours, they'd last and I'd be shot for the day. So everyone was wondering what was happening. Meanwhile, I was in bed. I couldn't leave the house. I couldn't, couldn't sh I didn't shower. The, one, the most I did was make uh, French toast for the kids, those toaster oven ones, and, and send them off to school and go right back upstairs. And it wasn't until about two weeks later where my agent, Donnie Meehan, finally didn't understand either what was happening because he didn't know this wasn't the guy he knew either. It wasn't the guy I knew. This was all strange. I didn't know what was happening. Finally said that, listen, we've got to get you some help. We're going to send you out to the Mayo Clinic and, and uh, the Sabres are going to help out. We, we think you know, we need to get you looked at. Well, fortunately, finally, I find maybe somebody does understand. And when I saw the doctors at the Mayo Clinic, they said to me, listen, we saw your hit. We understand what's going on. You've suffered a grade three. You've had multiple concussions. You hit your forehead on, your hot, and on the ice, and we feel that you might have a vascular damage there. We consider it a minor brain injury. He says, what happens, your right frontal lobe is responsible for your moods and your personality. And what happens is, in many cases, it's almost like a numbing effect. And then you're pushing through an injury that hasn't even healed. And sometimes it doesn't come out right away. And we've seen this happen in a lot of car accidents. But because you lost your helmet and your he forehead slapped on the ice and all your migraine headaches are right here, tells us that that's most likely where you hit your head on the ice with your forehead. And this is all very normal for somebody who's had multiple concussions and just went through what you went through. You would not, I broke down, I could not believe that finally, 14 years of playing hockey, finally somebody understood what I was going through. And they said to me and the doctor and Dr. Kelly, who helped me later on because this, I could go on and on with the story, but he said, just fortunately, just be thankful that you didn't get hit again when you were playing during that period of time when they let you go back. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you've already had multiple concussions. You're already coming off a bruise injury to your brain. There's a good chance if you took another hit to the head, you could have had some permanent problems the rest of your life. And that scared, scared me to death. And I'm thinking, here we are, it's 1996. Doctors, highest level professional sports, captain of the team, and I was put at that risk. Knowing what we know and knowing that here's grade three unconscious, go to the hospital, don't play for a minimum of two, three weeks if you've had more than five concussions. And I realized that I wasn't at a rational place to make any of those decisions. And if you come across a player most likely that he's had a concussion or he's had one in a short period of time, he's not at a place either to make those decisions. And so what ended up happening was I went through a series of months where uh, you're almost like a punch drunk type of state. I remember talking with people and they said, boy, it's, I haven't talked to you in a month and you're a different person. And six weeks later, I finally was able to leave and see the guys, although I was still very scared and very emotional, withdrawn and depressed. I remember seeing the guys for the first time and, and having trouble walking into a rink. I hear I lived my whole life since I was seven years old in a hockey rink. Now I'm having trouble walking into a rink. So it took me six months before I was back to my old self. And I remember calling the doctor one night in the Mayo Clinic and saying, now, Doc, this is all physiological, right? I mean, if I didn't hit my head, I wouldn't be going through the emotional and the depression and and the headaches, and the, oh yeah, Pat, I'm a doctor. It's because you hit your head you're, you're going through this. I said, Doc, because you're not just being nice because I feel like I'm losing my mind. He said, no, it's physiological. And of course, I went to bed that night, woke up because I woke up every night for two months straight at 2 o'clock in the morning with a headache and, and then had trouble all day long. And I said, you know what, I think the doctor's just being nice. I think really something's happening to me. And I, then I'd be, we, I would become paranoid. 
to the point where I'd have to pick up the phone at 8 o'clock in the morning, call the doctor and say, Doc, tell me again now. This is physiological because I hit my head. But when you're going through that at the time, you don't know. You only know what you're feeling. You only know what you're experiencing. You don't even know. It's almost like taking that enthusiastic person and taking him and setting him off to the side. The person who's used to being a father of three, who's used to captain of the team, who's used to scoring goals, and used to doing all those things now. He can't do any of those things, let alone get out and drive a car, leave the house. So literally just set that person aside and deal with what's happening to you now. And, and it's a scary dark road. It's a scary tunnel because you, you don't remember. You don't know if that's ever going to come back because you're stuck in what's happening to you now. It's almost like dropping a computer on the ground and plugging it in and expecting everything to go back to the way it was and all the, the programs to fit and normal and everything to kind of connect. And it just doesn't work that way. And I'm sure Dr. Kelly has explained that. So the things that happen to you and it happen, and everybody who says they have concussions, well, I was just like that. I was like, oh, yeah, I've had a concussion. But when there's a cumulative effect, and when you've used up your reserve and that battery that supplies the healing process for your brain is starting to become depleted, um, you understand that post-concussion starts to set in, and you've crossed that line. So your ego tells you, well, yeah, I've had a concussion. But I can tell you from experience, post-concussion is a whole different thing. You can take every injury, knee reconstructions, broken jaws, you know, surgeries, you know, all kinds of different things, and take the five concussions put together. This thing compared to what you go through in post-concussion syndrome. So my biggest concern as somebody who's experienced it and has to retire later on because um, at that point in time um, I sought, sought out the best help in Dr. Kelly and felt great for seven months and realized and said listen I don't feel like I'm finished playing hockey but I have a fa I'm a father I'm a family you know, I have three children a beautiful wife and I said I, there's no way I'm going to put that at risk I said I need to know and I need to find out if I have a chance to go back and play after feeling great for seven months and once again, I ran into all kinds of roadblocks, and I ran into doctors that were starting to become psychologists who wouldn't, wouldn't even, you know, well, if it was my daughter, you know, I, I'm not so sure I'd be playing. I said, well, I don't, I don't want to know. I want to know from your medical opinion what you think. Um, talked with my wife, went thorough, explained to me everything that happened, everything that happens in injuries, explained to me the risks and the ramifications, explained to me that, you know, fortunately that each concussion I had was usually spread out over a year period of time and thank God I didn't get hit in succession because of the second impact and because of the exponential factor which if you get hit a second time in a short period of time it compounds it maybe five or ten times the damage and after going through that and finally seeing the light there too I was able to make a decision six months ago there was no way I never thought I'd ever be able to play hockey again Never thought my wildest dreams that going through what I went through, that was it for me. I wasn't even going to go to a hockey rink. And then all of a sudden, everything came back, the enthusiasm, the drive, the excitement, the passion. And I told myself, you know, if I can go back and play, there's something telling me I'm not done yet. Plus, I didn't want to have to live with this one hit that not only maybe changed my whole hockey career, but maybe got me in life, too. And I said, I have to listen to what's telling me. But then not only do I have to listen to the passion, I have to find the best experts out there who have researched this and are able to tell me what's in my best interest and if I can go back and play and what the risks really are from as much data and expertise and, and experiments that they've had. And fortunately, I was able to do that. And I was able to go back and make a decision. And exactly what Dr. Kelly said to me would happen happened to me about three quarters of the way through last season and I took a, a fluky hit running to my own teammate it was very innocent and I received him I guess you could call it a minor concussion but when you've had five or six no concussions minor and realized that it took me about six months for a minor concussion the s symptoms weren't as severe the symptoms weren't as drawn out I never had a real migraine headache 
the symptoms of the milder sort lingered for the long time, which he had said most likely could happen. But no, I, know, I don't see any long-term cognitive problems. I don't see any long-term risk to your health. I said, Doc, I said, that's my most concern. I said, my responsibility now is I've played 14 years. I don't have to go back. But thank God I did go back because I needed to do what I had to do as far as kind of finish things and prove to myself that I could go back and overcome this and play, which is a benefit too because in some cases you can go back and play. And then in some cases I realize now that even if I take the minor, a minor hit or a minor concussion, that it might take me even longer to come back. If I took a major concussion, um, I may not come back to 100%. There are no guarantees in life. But I said, Doc, I know now what's at stake. And I've talked to players like Paul Correa. And the thing that scares me is that we're talking about players that, when I had my first concussion, I was 25. Now we're talking about players that have had them in high school, and juniors, by the time they hit the NHL, they've already had three, maybe four. Guys are bigger, they're faster, they're stronger. It's going to happen. I don't know if anyone saw ESPN the other night when um, a teammate, a former teammate of mine, Jeff Bukaboom, I don't know if anyone saw that on ESPN. It just it makes me sick to my stomach when I see a, a guy come from behind and punch a six-foot-five guy in the back of the head when he's not looking and knock him out and his head hits the ice. And that's what's happening in our game in times. They're trying to clean it up. They're making that effort. They're saying that, you know, there's no respect. But yet, when you talk about the NHL, it's easy to, to blame the players and just say there's no respect. But then there's an environment that's created that allows it. Everybody's responsible. Nobody's to blame. And so in your situation, whether it be football or, or hockey, the players will come across and at some point. My agent uh, was a big help to me. He knew that something wasn't right. Um, and the way we're headed, and Dr. Kelly probably could second that, is that the only reason why it hasn't just blown out, came out and said this has got to change is because nothing's tragic happened. Our society waits for something tragic or a crisis to happen before it changes. And unfortunately, it doesn't see the change coming or the crisis that's going to happen. And um, I just hope that, that players that come in the game nowadays don't have to make a decision because they've had so many hits and brains to the, you know, uh, bruises to the brain that they have to retire. You know, I have a, you know, I have a young son and two daughters now, and, you know, I played that. And I went through that macho part, and that was part of the game. And I didn't, <coughs> mind, I didn't mind a physical game, but I'll tell you, looking back now, if those intentional hits weren't allowed and anything above the neck wasn't allowed, I'd still be playing today. I could probably play three or five more years and have fun. Just to share a story with you that it's very real, it's very scary, it can happen. And I, I think of Steve Young often because he's had multiple concussions. But he hasn't gone through post-concussion. And I hope he never has to experience that. He's kind of like watching his career, I think he's gone along the edge. Unfortunately, he hasn't had that one hit that's put him over and then he all of a sudden he wakes up one day and things are strange. And I hope he never experiences that. But you don't know, just like I was in his shoes, I would have kept playing too, but you don't know until you've been there and you've experienced it. And it's very hard to say it, to tell an athlete that, because the, the power of being out there on the ice is so much stronger. And the macho part of it, that the education and the awareness that we don't know can happen.